Hey everyone, it's good to see you all. Um, I wanted to just quickly thank our audience members because they've been so great about submitting really thoughtful questions for our panelists. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all our audience members here. Uh, and of course, I wanted to thank the ECR team who worked very hard to put this event together. So I think at this point, we could all introduce ourselves and I can go first. I am Narmada Paul. I am a clinical assistant professor at the University of Kentucky and I'm part of the ED ECR leadership team. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let my colleagues who helped me put together this event in, uh, introduce themselves. Yes, I'll go next. Hi everyone, my name is yes. Lisan Safavian. I am also a Motivation Sick member and a member of the Early Career uh, Scholars Committee and it's a pleasure to be here. I work at UC Irvine and um, it's nice to meet you all. Alex, do you wanna go next? <laughs> sure. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alex Broman. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at um, a liberal arts college, College of the Holy Cross. Um, and I'm also um, a member of Motsig and um, the um, multiple careers uh, subcommittee. Becca, do you wanna go next? <laughs> sure, hi, I'm Becca. I am a assistant professor of special education at Eastern Michigan and a member of the Motsig. And uh, the CR subcommittee, and I'm really glad that we are able to do this. All right, uh, Jessica. Hi everyone, I'm Jess. I'm uh, the new co-chair of the Motsig Early Co Career Committee, and I'm very excited to be in this session. And I want to thank our other committee for working so hard to put this together and for everyone that has joined. Annette? Hi, I'm Annette. I'm an associate research scientist at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I am the other ECR co-chair, um, and I'm super grateful for this subcommittee um, and all of our panelists for, for putting yeah. together this amazing event. Yeah, I think we have done all the ECR introductions, at least everyone who's here. Ashley, uh, do you want, oh, Ashley's here. Ashley, do you want to introduce yourself? You're introducing all the ECR members. Sure. I'm Ashley Vaughn, and I'm the Associate Director of Northern Kentucky University's um, Center for Integrative Natural Science and Mathematics. Perfect. All right. Uh, I think we can transition to introducing our panelists next. Thank you so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon and sharing your time with us and being willing to share your stories uh, with all of us. So again, as I call on each of you, if you can quickly introduce yourselves, that would be great. So um, Dr. Tarana Khan, if, you, if we could start with you, that would be awesome. Hi, I'm Tarana. I am the Education Research and Evaluation Analyst at PBS SoCal. Perfect. Nice to see all of you today. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ananya Mateos. Hi everybody. I am an assistant professor at St. Norbert College in the small department of education that we have here. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see you too. Uh, Dr. Jason Chen. Good afternoon, I'm Jason Chen and I am an associate mm -hmm. professor at uh, William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm an educational psychologist, study motivation, so that's why I'm here. Great. Uh, Dr. Jamal Matthews. Hey everyone, my name is Jamal. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan um, in Ann Arbor, and um, yeah, just happy to be here uh, in the School of Education there as well. Well, we are happy to have you all here. I'm gonna um, let Nesan take the conversation forward uh, with, 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 the, with the help of the questions that all of you helped us put together, essentially. Yeah, so Nesan, do you wanna carry the conversation forward then? Sure, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, again, I want to thank you, the four of you, for uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, one of the missions of this subcommittee has been uh, to support engaging with research outside of the traditional research one uh, institutions. How do we mentor students who might even be looking for careers where they can use their skill sets and their degrees? They can engage in research, do ed educational psychology research, but not necessarily be within that R1 institution, which um, we had another event to this topic and it would generate a lot of interest, which is why now we're here. We're so thankful that 
you all are willing to share your experiences so that others can get to know what the different paths look like, whether you're in an R1 or you're at a liberal arts institution or an R2 or uh, like you Toronto who's outside the academy right now. Um, and that was the same sort of setup last time. So we really appreciate you lending us your time. So with that said, the first question we sort of wanted to ask in general, and it's sort of a big question, but it's what, what was your path to your current position? So uh, sort of demystifying this idea that you graduate, you have a PhD in hand, and now you're person X. Like what was your path to get there? Or um, how did you turn about, come to your position? Or were there certain turning points that maybe had to pivot into the position that you're at? It would be great if you could just share with us a little bit of that experience. I think I can go first. I'm Jason. Um, after I finished my doctorate, so I, uh, let's see, I guess when, I'm trying to figure out where I should start. But so I, I did all my degrees at a place called Emory University in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Um, so when I graduated with my PhD from there, um, it was in 2010, um, the market was really, was really terrible. Um, and so when I was uh, looking for jobs, um, ended up doing a postdoc. And so I did the postdoc at the Grad School of Education at Harvard, and it was in a learning uh, technologies department. Um, got to work with some really great folks there, and I, I loved it. Uh, it, was, it was really nice to sort of apply the work that I had done in my doctorate in sort of, it was in a new context um, with some folks who just were doing excellent work. Um, so um, from, the, from there, I ended up getting a position here. Uh, and, you know, it's, it was a tenure track position. I, got, I have tenure here now, which is fantastic. Um, and, and I guess there was a turning point during my, my postdoc Part of the reason why the postdoc was so nice is that I, I, you know, I got I got a little space to sort of like think to myself, is this what I want? Um, and so I did like go to conferences and talk with folks at, um, you know, like nonprofits, uh, some people who are out of the academy, people who are in sort of like the big flagship universities, people who are in small liberal arts colleges. I get to chat with different people. And um, I think the first thing that went through my mind was, well, do I want to be in academics or not? That was the sort of first decision point. And, you know, I sided with, obviously, the side I sided with, because at the end of the day, I was like, I'm, I, I love teaching. And that's something that I can't really separate from myself. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, before my life, before I, I did the PhD. I, I taught high school chemistry and physics for five years in, um, in, in schools in Atlanta and in Seattle. And I knew that that was a part of my identity that like was very near and dear to me. So teaching was big to me. So I was like, okay, I'm going into academics. From there, it was just about sort of like where. And uh, when I was on the job market in 2011, 2012, um, I got... I got interviews at a lot of different places from big, big places to places where I am right now. And um, I don't know that there was any like logical sort of like, if this, then that sort of thing that happened. It was more just like, I went and it felt right. And that was the, that was the, that's, I mean, that's the beauty of going on campus interviews is, you know, you get to spend some time there and you get a feel for the place and talk with people, you probe a little. And at the end of the day, you know, for me, that was, it was a good feel. It felt right. And it was like, I, I like it here. So I don't know if there was any like, you know, algorithm that I was going through. It, it just was. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's an interesting point you raised that, you know, even just going out on these talks and getting to talk to people could elucidate whether or not that's something you want to keep pursuing. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a really quick announcement as well as we're talking. If anyone has questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and we'll have someone moderating the chat so we can um, 
address them once everyone's done speaking. Thank you. Um, so who would like to sort of share their experience next? I can follow up from Jason because I feel like we have a similar trajectory in that sense because I was a special ed teacher in St. Paul. Um, I loved being in the classroom with elementary kids and but yet I felt kind of like I, I could see all of these things around teacher preparation when I was in that environment and I had all these bigger questions that I wanted to follow up through my grad degree. So I ended up finishing my master's and going into a doctoral program at USC um, in teacher ed initially. And from there, I actually interspersed into ed psych slowly. Um, and, and so then I became a, a part of another lab with Dr. Gail Sinatra. And, she, you know, so then I was in this intersection of teacher ed and ed psych. And so my path has always been sort of non-traditional in that sense, because um, I'm always really curious and I let my inquiry guide me. And um, I'm, I'm really not prone to having just a really fixed research agenda. So I really needed a place that would nurture um, sort of my intellectual curiosity and, and the directions I want to go and the freedom to do that. So a liberal arts college was a really great fit for me in that sense, um, because, you know, when you're at an R1, you really should be trying to have a really specific research agenda that you're doing a lot of grants on um, and et cetera. But at a liberal arts college, I think there's a little bit more freedom to collaborate focus on your teaching guide, you know, let your teaching guide some of what you want to in, go into inquiry on. So um, all of those things make liberal arts a really great fit for me, and I would assume for many of you, so. Thank you for that, Ananya. I can go next. Um, so my journey to this job, this role um, sort of began when I was in grad school. So I became interested in program evaluation while I was in school because I started considering career pathways outside of academia due to wanting more work-life balance. So I felt like grad school, the work just sort of always just was there and happening just nonstop throughout the day. And I really wanted like set cutoff points and which I guess you could set for yourself, but it just sort of felt like it was just always there. And if you weren't doing it, I was feeling guilty that I wasn't doing it. So, and I also wanted a little bit less pressure to publish. So during my fourth year, I started working as a research assistant at a research and consulting firm where I got some experience analyzing programmatic outcome data for community initiatives and nonprofit organizations and government agencies. And then after working there, I realized that I really liked that kind of work and I did want to pursue a career in program evaluation, but I didn't really like that research focus. So I wanted that research focus to be more centered in education and psychological motivation, which is what was the type of research I was doing in grad school. So that brought me to my role at PBS SoCal. Um, but before I even applied for this job, I had applied to other types of research analyst positions as well. But uh, eventually, I land at PBS SoCal, where we are doing, um, we do family engagement programs to help guide families and early childhood educators in their efforts to support preschoolers' early math and STEM skills at home. So it really just sort of fit right into the type, my, my particular interest and the type of work that I wanted to do. Thank you for that, Tarana. Um, and Jamal? Yeah, um... I'll round up the rear. Uh, thanks again for having me here. So, yeah, I was um, I was teaching math in the Bronx, uh, you know, prior to going uh, to grad school, and my teaching experiences there just um, they just opened up a lot of curiosity um, around the social dynamics of classrooms, um, student psycho uh, psychology, um, policy, a variety of different things. So. That was really what pushed me to to want to go to formal doc program to learn more about these issues. I actually, I didn't go thinking I would become an academic, or I didn't have sort of um, an end goal in mind. Uh, I was really just curious um, about the things that you know I saw, you know, from my my teaching experiences um, in the Bronx, and I think I carried that through my doc program. For most of it, um, I think by the time I got to the end of it, I really wanted to get into um, 
working at some community organizations and some grassroots places. I remember I applied to the Harlem Children's Zone, um, which was really hot and popular at the time, um, and a couple of other places. But for whatever reason, um, just couldn't get much traction there. Um, and I don't know, I think just uh, the desire to, you know, want to be employed, you know, um, you know, getting, you know, being 30 years old and, you know, um, not being employed just kind of made me look to other options. So um, there was a position at Montclair State University, which was, you know, historically a teaching institution, but now it's an R2. And I wanted to, I uh, applied there, you know, um, things really worked out. It took me back home, uh, close to New York City. Um, it stayed there 10 years. And uh, Jason talked a little bit about space. Um, and I just thought that that was uh, an interesting way to frame his experience because I feel that being at Montclair State also provided some of the space that I needed to really kind of re-up some of my skills and also just build confidence, you know. Um, I, I think I now know at heart that I'm an academic. At the time, as a student, I didn't know that and I didn't have the confidence um, to really see myself as an academic. But starting out at Montclair State and spending a lot of time there, I spent 10 years there, um, it was really the perfect place for me to be, to really sort of like crystallize um, my academic identity, I guess, for lack of better words, um, develop some of that confidence, develop some skills in a place that wasn't super high intensity R1 publish 6,000 things a year. Um, so I just think that was a really important um, sort of serendipitous way that I had kind of gotten to the academy there. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for all of you, I think it's really important to have these conversations about, you know, all these different uh, trajectories that we can take to get to where we are. And sometimes we'll go back and forth and whatnot. And so I think this paints a really nice picture of that. So with that said, also along the same lines, I mean, Toronto, you brought up the work uh, life balance issue, which I think is on the top of a lot of our minds. Um, I know I, as a new parent, trying to juggle all of that is constantly like, how do I, how do I come home and turn that part of me off and turn this part of me on? And so that kind of leads us into our next question, where most of the doctoral students that are typically engaging with Motivation SIG or just, you know, in a doctoral program are familiar with what and recent a research intensive institution affords in terms of just everyday experiences. And so that brings us to our question of sort of thinking about, well, what is your daily life like? What do you do in a typical day or a typical work week? So I think there's a lot of curiosity about what happens, for example, at an evaluation or industry type institution versus what is what do you do at a liberal arts? Like we understand that there's teaching involved or what is it like at an R2 versus an R1? And a lot of people kind of have an idea sort of what we do at an R1, but not so much around the other um, spaces. So it would be nice for you if you could speak to that. And even in terms of like, do you get to engage with people that are junior to you, whether they're students or they're interns, for example, for you, Tarana, um, it would be great if you could maybe share a little, a little bit of that. I can go first again. <laughs> uh, so I'm at William and Mary. It's a liberal arts college, um, and um, you know there's a school of education within it. We have about 47, 48 people at the school of education with three departments. Curriculum and instruction is one of them, and that's where I am. And um, <clears throat> I teach two too. So I teach two in the fall, two in the spring, and. Um, as I said, I love teaching. It's something that's a big part of my identity. Um, and coming from Emory, um, I was, so at Emory, the department, um, there used to be a department, it's now gone, but the department uh, was part of arts and sciences. And so um, if you were an econ major, for example, you could take classes at, at, at education. And that was a model that I grew up with. <clears throat> it wasn't the case at 
William and Mary. And when I got there, I pushed for that to make to make that happen. Um, and so I I love it. I'm I'm really happy there in terms of teaching because so I teach all undergraduates. Uh, in the summertime, I, um, I'll teach um, a class of grad students, uh, but primarily I'm interacting with undergraduates. Uh, that's the beauty for me. That's where I, that's that's my sweet spot. Um, really love interacting with undergraduates and teaching that population. Um, and so, you know, I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I basically dedicate like half my day, maybe three quarters of my day to teaching on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, and then all other days, I'm writing and reading and thinking. <laughs> and um, I, I'm, a lead, I'm a lead PI on an NS grant and a co-PI on an IES grant. And so there's a lot of meetings that happen with that too and coordinating. And so my other, my non-teaching days are like figuring stuff out uh, for those different grant projects. Um, and so that's how I divide my time. Um, and, you know, I will say that my doctoral advisor and the person I worked under at my postdoc at Harvard were these, these two people were incredible teachers and I learned so much from them and got a lot of materials from them. And that's super duper helpful, right? So I came into my first year teaching um, really, really well prepared. Um, and I think that that does a huge, uh, um, it, it's, it's amazing what that does for you because uh, you don't have to do as much heavy lifting intellectually, you know, uh, with, with uh, creating a new course or figuring out how to teach a course or whatever. Um, and so I was able to move right in and, and teach those courses that needed to be taught and um, did a really great job with it. So being able to have that part of my life taken care of uh, for the most part was, was, was really helpful. And I was able to dedicate more time towards um, things that I um, knew would take a lot of heavy lifting. So Jamal wrote uh, meetings and that is, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I work as a research scientist and I could three quarters of my time is meetings right now. <laughs> so I get it. Um, also on two grants. Um, thank you for that. And so I wanted to follow up with, uh, with a brief question sort of, I know you teach undergraduates, do you have chance or opportunities to mentor them? And what does that sort of look like in your position? And that'll also apply for anyone else who wants to speak on it. Yeah. So well, I mean, there's a couple of honors um, research uh, I guess fellows. Uh, like for example, there's something called the Monroe Scholar, and so um, I, I do I do have opportunities to do that. So uh, if you're in one of these sort of honors research thing uh, like things, they uh, they will come and seek me out, and um, I'll chat with them and say, yeah, that sounds like that sounds like fun. Let's do it, you know. And so I'll mentor them. I do also. They, there are doc students at the School of Education as well. They're not in CNI. Uh, they're in school psychology or they're in leadership. Um, and I, I don't, I, I try to limit how much I, I am involved in those uh, in mentoring doctoral students, just because a lot of times they're coming from, from um, a world that's very different from, from mine, uh, but they, they're seeking me out because I have expertise in social cognitive theory or technology or something like that. And uh, that's that's for me. I'm um, I'm a bit pickier with that, uh, and so, but I I still have in my time here. I've been here. This is my tenth year, and I think I've chaired three dissertations. Uh, so I do have some opportunities to do that as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, who would like to go next? I mean, if I can just go. If we're going to keep the same order going, so. Um, I'm also at a liberal arts college, St. Norbert, and I would say that I have a, I have a slightly larger teaching load, uh, Jason, because I have a 3-3 load, um, which means that I do have a considerable amount of planning and prep uh, with those three classes. Um, I would say that that's probably going to get a bit easier because, you know, I'm in my second year, so I, I did have to plan two courses from scratch that uh, my grad school wasn't 
necessarily preparing me for. Um, and that's okay. And, and I think it's a good skill set to kind of learn early on. And I don't mind having put that time in, but it did take away from, you know, other things that maybe I could have worked on like research. So um, I will say though, now that I'm sort of settled in, I would say like 50% of my work week goes to teaching and then 25 goes to research and then the rest goes to like just I'm just gonna call it admin like all the things like the meetings the the crap <laughs> all the stuff that you don't want to deal with um because and I I think that's gonna change as I move along um but even in that um I was able to get a lot of conference pubs done with with the help of collaborators um did a, my first grant submission in this first year of faculty. So I think like it's absolutely doable. I think another big focus for undergrad um, institutions is the relationship building with students. Um, my office door is always open when I'm on campus. Office hours are actually office hours. Like, you know, students want to come in and chat, chat. They want to get to know you. This is their developmental time to be on campus, be a student. And so that's it's mentoring in a, in a more social emotional type of way, I think, um, that maybe doctoral advisors are doing in a different capacity. So um, I'm really pleased with that aspect of this job. And so with that comes advisement. Um, undergrads need a lot of advisement for their academic trajectory. Um, and so that's a big component of our time during the semester in certain slots. Um, did I answer everything <laughs> for that? Okay. I thought you asked a follow-up question, but I think I answered it through the mentoring thing. Yeah. You did it. Thank you so much. And, I was asking about opportunities to mentor. Right. right. And I do want to end up um, doing some research with undergrads, but I have not set that up yet in full honesty. Like um, I'm waiting to get a couple of grants before, so I can actually fund students because even undergrads deserve to get paid. So thank you so much for that. Trana? Um, I would say the breakdown of my typical work week would probably be 50% data analysis and reporting on that data, maybe 35% planning, developing, and designing evaluation, and probably the, the remaining 15 meetings and collaborating with other people. Um, I spend most of my time working pretty independently, so I have a lot of time to devote to my projects. And um, our department moves pretty quickly. It's pretty fast paced. So I often have to plan and design and carry out an evaluation project in like very short timeline. Um, and I get kind of short notice and I, but luckily I have that time that I can move things down on the to-do list and then prioritize other things. Um, and then there are other projects that are more open-ended so I can have that's a little bit more flexible time for me. So I don't really have to worry about deadlines for those. Um, I would say I probably spend most of my day analyzing, creating reports. The report building is very time consuming because it has to be, I think maybe the program that I use, I use Canva to build the reports and it's not like, it's user friendly, but it's, it's time consuming to build out every single part and like present data in like a really nice way. Because um, these reports go out to our stakeholders, or our, our funders, people that we get the grants from, as well as just people in our community who we've worked with and they're interested to see the impacts that we've made with their with the families they serve. Um, I wouldn't say I have too much opportunity to mentor others up until about uh, a few months ago. It was just me doing research, so I was the only evaluation person on our in our team. Our team is about is six people. It's pretty small, but we all have our own role. But we did bring on a research assistant recently, and she provides support to some of our on some of our projects. So I've been working with her, and I don't know if I would call it a mentorship relationship. She's, she's she works part time helping me with stuff, so I give her feedback and stuff like that. But um, I guess I, I wouldn't really say that I have anyone to mentor for now. But our department is growing, so it's anticipated eventually we would grow our um, research department eventually. Thank you for that. It sounds like she's more of an apprenticeship role, essentially, learning from you and observing you, um, which is, I think, still equally important. And I think for people who are interested in sort of even getting that experience of interacting and sort of training and whatnot, that's, that's good to hear. So thank you for sharing that. And um, Jamal, what about you? 
Yeah, um, similar to what's already been said, I think, you know, um, the work-life balance issue will be an issue. <laughs> um, you know, it's it was an issue in grad school, it was an issue 10 years ago, it's an issue today. Um, but it, I think it just looks a little different over time. Um, the first couple of years, I think, regardless of where you are regarding being in an academic institution, teaching is going to take up a pretty significant um, amount of time of what you're doing, um, particularly if you haven't done a lot of, you know, university level teaching um, prior to that. So even if you have course releases and are just teaching like a one and one or one and two, you know, it's still going to take a lot of time because you're building a lot of things from scratch, trying to figure out the dynamics of working with teaching students and a variety of other things. And then, you know, at our, in, our two institutions, you know, you're typically teaching a few more classes. So I was teaching, I think, a 3-3 three, three, um, for maybe the first four years uh, while I was there. Um, so just a little bit heavier of a course load. Sometimes uh, you're teaching, you know, it might be a 3-3, three, three, but it might be two preps or one prep. Um, so those are little ways that you can still hit your load, but um, not have as many preps or do as much work. But uh, I think regardless of where you are, if you're in an academic position, teaching is going to take up a lot of time in the first year, in particular, and maybe even into the second year. I will also say, from my experience, you know, um, teaching helped me tremendously. Um, it helped me solidify ideas that I was kind of shaky on prior to that. It helped me, you know, um, I think it made me a better methodologist, you know, figuring out how to explain um, some approaches to students in different ways outside of just the way that I think about it. So I was, it was a ton of work, but I was really grateful for, for those teaching experiences because I think without them, I think other parts of, of what I do as, as a researcher and even as a mentor, you know, just wouldn't be as well, wouldn't be as strong. I wouldn't be as strong in those areas. So, um, at, in my experience at, you know, in R2, um, there, there were definitely opportunities to, to mentor um, students that I took advantage of. I actually ran a mentorship program for the last five years while I was at Montclair State. It was a mentorship program where um, undergraduate students at the university mentor sixth grade boys in a neighboring community. Um, so it's the Threads program. I'll you know throw the link um, in the chat just for, for anyone who cares. But it was a really neat program because the um, undergrad mentors took a course with me, where I was essentially mentoring them in their mentorship of middle school boys. So it was sort of a really nice and interesting multi generational mentorship program. Um, it also included some research components where students were doing case studies of, uh, of some of their mentees, so learning a little bit about research. And it was just really generative for me, you know, um, to see the mentors grow, you know, in their knowledge of, you know, um, Black and Latinx adolescents, um, but then also see, you know, the boys grow as well um, from interacting with the undergrads. And that was really a great experience, actually, you know, um, that is sort of burgeoned into a lot of those undergrad mentors um, transitioning onto my research projects. Uh, I still have one that I work with. Um, you know, he was uh, a mentor in that program the first year, and now he's my program manager you know, for my research. Uh, so, yeah, there have been opportunities. I think just after you get through the initial year or two of just like figuring out how to teach, how to teach well, how to relate to students, figuring out ways to really tie in your teaching with the core things that you're interested in. You know, if that's mentorship, so how do you leverage your teaching to get more opportunities to mentor students? Um, if it's research, you know, how do you leverage your teaching, you know, to, um, you know, go hand in hand with the work that you're doing or the project that you're working on? That's all. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
it's nice to hear across the spectrum that there's also leniency in how much you can interact or, or the kinds of interactions you can have and um, whether or not you want to educate others or work with others or mentor others um, to whatever degree and in whatever capacity, whether it's social emotional, whether it's giving them a new skill set, whether or not it's teaching them to be future mentors themselves. It's great to hear that range. So I appreciate you all for sharing that. Um, with that said, and you just mentioned uh, prep as well, Jamal, um, I'm not sure if all the participants here understand what one or two preps mean. So if you wouldn't mind just clarifying that really quickly. I know we've been talking about two twos, three threes, but I know it's also language that's very specific to a certain discipline. Right, yeah, my bad there. Um, so essentially a prep is a preparation that you have for a course or the amount of time, effort, resources that goes into prepping a course. So I might be teaching three classes this semester, but um, two of those classes are the same class, just different sections. So I'm teaching three classes, but I have two preps because really I'm teaching two different courses, two sections of one course. So, you know, um, the less preps, the better, you know, because it means you're only preparing for, if you have one prep, you're only preparing for one class, although you might teach multiple sections of that one class. Um, you know, that semester. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, that sort of also now it's time to transition over to our next question, which is about engaging in research, right? Um, so for all of you, what are some supports or maybe barriers that you see in engaging in research? And you might all define research a little differently. So for example, the work that you might do Toronto versus uh, the work that you might be doing Jamal versus the work that you, uh, Ananya and Jason might be doing. So I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about that and uh, maybe also addressing what are the expectations from your position versus what are you engaging with in addition to? So for example, um, you might not be required to do formal research or it might be an evaluation report. So if you could just kind of be specific about the types of works that you're doing or what you're talking about. Um, that would be great. I can start. <laughs> um, I wanted to also just kind of riff off of what Jamal was saying um, about the teaching and the, and the research being uh, really closely linked, because I think it's related to what I'll be uh, sort of mentioning here. Um, I, I feel like that should be amplified uh, all the, a lot just because it it really you know it in like an ideal world in the in the in the academy the teaching and the research and the service are all linked together and the more that you can do that the better and um it sounded like i, I know i've seen uh jamal's website um uh with with the mentoring program and that's i feel like that's like the embodiment of teaching research and service all all combined and working in harmony and that I feel like that's the thing that you really want to try to aim for and um you know the transition to the question at hand like what are some supports institutional supports um and you know I, I can say that at, at William and Mary um we don't have the sorts of supports that you would have at like the University of Virginia or University of Michigan, uh, where they, they literally have an army of people who can really, you know, there's this there's called pre-award and post-award work, right? So like pre-award is helping you to prepare um, proposals and make sure that your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed for, uh, for, for grants, because NSF is different from IES, which is different from NIH, and you have to make sure that all things are exactly the right way and all that stuff. And so, you know, the big, big, big universities uh, that have that research infrastructure have that, and it's amazing. Um, I'm at William Mary, we don't have that. And so, um, in terms of resources, I do have outstanding undergraduates. And um, they are a source of um, inspiration. They're also there in terms of like a post award type of thing. Um, they help with data analysis. They're really research like minded. Um, they're hungry. Uh, and so at a place 
like my institution, the the undergraduates really are absolutely fantastic. And so that's a resource. Um, the, the people I collaborate with are all over the place. Um, and I mean that geographically, but also in terms of fields. And so uh, being an undergraduate uh, institution uh, and really now that School of Ed is sort of more linked in with the arts and sciences, I worked, so for example, one of my colleagues is a geologist and we, Early on in my life, in my life here, um, we shared some students because she had some geology students who were really interested in geology education, and so uh, the two of us mentored these three students together. And um, this geology professor, his name's her, her name's Heather. <clears throat> um, she's also got a lot of experience with NSF, and she saw an RFP come out of NSF. A request for proposals and she saw it and she was like jason i feel like this is you 100 percent um i want to support you on this because i want to i want to see you get it and she did she was amazing and i would never have seen this because it came out of the geosciences director at nsf and i am doing the kind of work i'm doing today because of that and so um you know in terms of resources i think everybody regardless of where you end up those are the sorts of resources you want to really try to leverage is the the, the relational resources um and i you know i there's a lot of heathers in every in every institution and so um i have i have a lot of relationships in this university that are really generative um and it's because i i take some time to actually get to know people and just go what are you interested in oh my gosh there's that oh and there's this and and, and you know it happens like I, I was I was a field trip parent for my my daughter you know and I was I was on a field trip and this uh, this other parent who's also a professor at, at London Mary but in a different department we just started talking and we now collaborate on a on a research project that's also really really fun and very generative. And so those are the resources that I think that regardless of what kind of institution you're at, those are the resources that you have control over, which is getting out there and okay, you're introverted, whatever, get out there and talk to people. And um, it's, it's fun, but it's also really generative um, in terms of uh, the work that you do. Thank you for that. I really appreciate you highlighting uh, the importance of cultivating relationships and that you don't necessarily need to feel um, constrained by the parameters of what your profession might look like on the outside as opposed to maybe what some of the opportunities that these uh, relationships might generate. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, like, where it goes is where you land like that place will shape you, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I thought that I would spend my entire career working with adolescents. Um, but because of the geo, geosciences stuff that I do, I, I work with adults, like I work with professors, and I never thought in a million years that I would work, you know, and that would be a focus of my study. Uh, but it's so it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's, it's taken me in a completely different direction. But it's, it's really great. But you know, you you kind of grow up in the in the soil that you land in, and um, you know it's you can't it's hard to predict what's going to happen. So you just kind of try try to figure out how to grow well in that area. Thank you, Ananya. What about you? So it's interesting we're talking about this because a few months ago our department redid their scholarship statement, like what what you need to kind of do to work towards tenure. And so I, I've been thinking about research just broadly in terms of that scholarship statement. And um, I will say that at a small college like this, the, the expectation is, is a little bit lower in terms of productivity as, as we probably have come to know it uh, in grad school. So, you know, you're still expected to publish peer reviewed things, um, but it, it expands kind of the, the, the oversight of what's included in scholarship. So community engaged work counts towards scholarship here. Um, you know, partnerships that you're 
framing and then generating um, kind of outputs together for, for different partnerships counts towards scholarship here. So a lot of different things, it, it's really expanded my view of what's possible in terms of um, kind of generating knowledge together with, with people. And so um, I've really appreciated that mindset once I've come here. That's not to say though, that some of that traditional research stuff isn't still happening because, you know, you come right out of grad school probably in, with multiple projects and collaborations already in play. And it's really up to you where you take those next, right? So I found myself still working with a lot of those same collaborators, same partners and new ones, uh, having gone to AERA, having gone to some of the smaller um, disciplinary conferences like NARST and SciPy. So you, you find your people um, through the networks and you keep going, you keep keep doing the work. Um, and so, and my grants office, so yes, Jason was talking about the big grants offices. We have one lady in our grants office, but she's my best friend because she spent so much time with me. <laughs> we like had to figure out all the different grants things together, like line by line, like, what does this mean? Like, cause like it's new for her too, because there's not a lot of people writing grants at our college, but I wanted to, and she figured it out with me. So even just like leveraging that relationship and building a partnership with her has brought us closer. Um, you know, we went really last minute for one of those grants and I was emailing her on a Saturday, like help. <laughs> and she, she helped me. Um, so, you know, it, you have to just do with what you have and, um, I feel a sense of tremendous potential and freedom um, having moved away from the restriction. I feel like I've been more productive this year, even though there's no expectation to produce in the way that I would have thought. So I hope that helps. Um, I feel like as scholars in academia, we are the intellectual asset of that institution or whatever institution you're at. So it's really up to you to produce what you feel like you are harnessing in terms of your own development. So. Good luck. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you. And I also appreciate how you position this idea of scholarship as generating knowledge. Um, cause, because there's a lot of ways to think about scholarship. And I think when you're at a doctoral granting institution, often it's sort of uh, branded as publications within peer reviewed journals. And that might not necessarily apply to everyone who's engaging in research, but it might not look the same. Um, what about you, Toronto? Would you? share a little bit about what you're doing and thank you. Yeah, um, so my role is sort of unique because before I joined this, before I joined PBS OCAL, there was no evaluation person, there was no research happening. So when I came in, my director told me this is a very unstructured role. We finally have enough money to support evaluation. So we just want you to build the evaluation from scratch. So. That was really fun for me because I had a lot of um, options to try different things out, redo it if I didn't like how it was going. It was sort of up to me what we were going to measure. So we eventually, after a lot of piloting, we settled on we wanted to measure parent confidence, the parent knowledge and awareness of math and science concepts, and also their positive math attitudes. So I think we finally settled on this like it was past a year. So the grant, the first couple of years of the grant was like almost over, but our funders are very, very flexible with us. So um, they were okay with that. But um, I guess I'll sort of define what research is. So research is my number one priority because I am the research here in researcher and in the, in the only one in the department. So, um, but that means developing the evaluation strategies that help us measure the impact of our programs, also designing surveys, developing um, all the measurement tools and the constructs, define, de like defining what our goals are and making sure we're measuring those goals and sticking to what we promised. Um, and basically our overall goal is to help families see that math and STEM learning can be fun and accessible to their everyday routines with children. So how can they bring this into their homes? Um, and so my role is just to make, make sure that's what we're doing with all the things that we're measuring. Um, in terms of grants, we have a department in PBS SoCal since we are a nonprofit public media station. This department helps us 
uh, seek out and apply to grants. So I don't do that myself. And they manage all the grants that we have. And they also report directly to these funders. So I just make sure I work with them pretty closely when it comes to reporting to report this is what we did, this is what we achieved, and this is what we're going to deliver back to them. So that's sort of nice to have that separated out that I do the research part and there's another department that does the grant seeking part. Um, so I guess um, because research was the number one priority for me, whenever I came into the role, they asked me, what do you need in terms in order to do your job? Because they didn't know like what, what would a researcher need to do stuff. So they asked me what type of software I needed, what sort of subscription services would I need, um, what kind of laptop I would need. And they made sure that I had all of that stuff. So that so I felt very supported in my role when I first started. And even though these aren't my own personal research projects like they were in grad school, it feels very personal because I was the one who built it from scratch and I was the one who started this from the ground up when there was nothing in place. So I sort of decided these were the things that I was, so I, I did lean more towards what I'd already been researching already and um, did a lot of work into what was already out there. And I don't have the benefit of having a mentor specifically in regards to research because my director, she was at the time she was getting her EDD, but she wasn't too familiar with a lot of the research out there. So um, I but I do get to collaborate with our program manager and our early learning coordinators who are actually running these workshops to figure out what we should be measuring and um, what we should be basically how we want to I have to I have to know what they're teaching the parents in order to evaluate it so it's a lot of back and forth between us to figure out what's the best way to evaluate things um in terms of professional development we're encouraged to participate in professional development opportunities such as conferences or trainings and whatever we're interested in doing so it's nice that we have that flexibility to find out um if, if we have a particular skill that we want to learn for instance like I want to learn about um, data visualization, I could find some training and, and take it through work. That's great. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I sort of was thinking about, too, is you mentioned, you know, you don't have a formal mentor or whatnot. Um, and for anybody else as well, uh, how do you uh, leverage maybe or your network, your existing networks? I know Jason was talking about the importance of these relationships. Do you reach out to professional organizations or some of your doctoral peers or, um, and we can always come back to that, but it was definitely something that came to mind for me in, in terms of how do you source the support that you need if you don't feel like a particular strand of it isn't there. Um, so uh, J Jamal, if you wouldn't mind sort of maybe speaking a little bit about how, whether or not your research is supported or how it's supported in the different ways. I know you were in R2 and now you're in R1. Um, so if you want to mind maybe talking a little about the differences in those experiences as well. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so, so I was at an R2, as I said, for 10 years. And um, so I've only been at one R2, obviously. So I don't want to make any generalizations, but my experience of that was, um, I was at an R2 that had a little bit of R1 envy, if that makes sense. So um, I think that, you know, Montclair State was going through a transition and really went through a transition of when I got there was um, a research institution that became an R2 maybe halfway through my time there uh, and really having ambitions of wanting to do more. So research actually was something that was um, emphasized there. Um, and, you know, contrary to what one might expect, there was a, a, a pretty narrow definition of what that was. So it was, you know, um, peer reviewed journal, journal articles. And, you know, you might expect that to only be the case at an R1 institution, um, but, it was actually quite similar. Um, and, you know, now that I've been in R1 for two years now, there are a lot of similarities actually, you know, um, between R1 and R2 institutions. I would say one of the differences that can become a challenge is that at our R2 institutions, many times the infrastructure is not there um, or it's 
in process or developing, and that really matters. So R1s, of course, expect a lot out of you, but they give you a lot of resources to help you be successful. Um, and it's not that I didn't have a lot of resources. Well, this is being recorded. All right. Um, so, you know, there were definitely resources, you know, um, at my previous um, institution, there was a lot of expectation and the resources didn't always match the expectation. So that was a little bit of a, of a challenge um, that I faced. Uh, found ways to navigate around that, um, particularly by, you know, in, in an R1 institution, you probably have a pretty productive lab of doctoral students that you're working with um, and have that uh, at my previous institution. So, you know, I carried out the same or similar work with primarily undergraduates and master's students and, you know, made it work and it was fun, you know, in the process. Um, so, different, um, but, you know, it did allow for some of those mentorship opportunities, which was you know, a previous question, but still stressful, but just a different type of stress when a lot is still expected of you w without always having, you know, the resources, you know, um, or feeling like you have the resources to, to meet some of those expectations. Um, I don't know if I missed any part of the question there, but, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Uh, no, I think you did a great job actually of also clarifying some of the differences and similarities that the different institutions provide. So I appreciate that. And I think one of the themes that's sort of um, coming across what everyone is mentioning is that uh, to your point about navigating around some of what's not there, uh, it's important to be flexible to think about what are the ways I can work around it um, if it's not directly provided. So I work at, at a, um, I'm a scientist, so non-tenure track position at an R1, but we have a grants person within our school itself, let alone the broader institution. So we're heavily supported to be uh, cranking out grants and peer review publication, right? But that's not necessarily reflective of all these other places. So it's, I think it's nice to see that breadth. I'm aware of the time and I just wanna remind everyone, we are going to run over into um, the 15 minute marker after the hour. So um, we have a little bit more time um, for anyone that's interested. And I think at this point, we've gone through several of the questions that we had prepared and proposed to you on the panel. And I think a lot, there was some discussion happening in the chat. So I want to open it up to, um, those who've been monitoring the chat, whether Annette or Jessica, um, and maybe present some of the questions that haven't been covered, that would be great. And then if not, I have some more that we can also continue talking about. But thank you everyone so far for, I know these are sort of broad questions and it's sort of hard to kind of encapsulate it into a short period of time, but I think it's nice exposure. So I appreciate that for all our early career scholars out there that are about to embark on the job market journey. While, while you're preparing questions, I, I had one more thing to just kind of add to the journey question that I forgot to say. So post PhD, I didn't actually talk about those steps. Um, just totally forgot. But I did a lectureship and a postdoc before getting to faculty. And I feel like I don't know why I forgot to talk about that. But those opportunities were transformative for me. I learned so much. And I think it was Jamal who said, you know, it, they, those opportunities helped me learn my field better, gain more confidence, build my research pubs a little more. So um, I really encourage all of you to keep an open mind for every opportunity because at each step of the way, you're going to get a lot of stuff um, going for you. Thank you for that. I think it's really important to um, highlight that, especially in the context that there are people who are also geographically restricted for certain periods of time. And so being able to sort of be uh, flexible in how you sort of satisfy your curiosity about generating knowledge or communicate, cultivating relationships within your network and engaging in maybe whether it's not, if whether or not it's students in the traditional sense, but people that are junior who want to learn from you, I think there's a lot of different ways that that can be achieved. And 
thank you for allowing us to have this conversation. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it for John. Yeah, I just put a question in the chat from one of the questions that was posted in our Google form. And this one is more directed to Tarana, and that's to what extent are your research priorities determined by your employer? And others can feel free to answer this as well, especially if you have um, grants where you're, you know, funded by someone other than uh, your university. I had a, just an add-on related question, also mostly for Tarana. But in your role, um, do you publish, and if so, like what do your publications look like? Are your outlets similar to the more traditional academic journals, or do you publish other places? Yeah. Um, so I'll answer the first question. Um, so first, I would say I have a lot of flexibility in determining what our research priorities are, but I know that's not the case for a lot of industry jobs. I've heard about other ones where you just have to measure what they tell you to measure. So I think maybe this is a, it's a little bit unique just because of maybe our size and just how small our department is. So we have certain programs that we run and I don't I'm not involved in the design of those programs but I do get to choose how I evaluate those programs. So I do have a lot of um, autonomy and, and creative license in, in that regard. In terms of publications, um, I'm not expected to publish, but we're, I, I did publish, I published with my director an article in an online journal. And um, it, was, it's, it wasn't like the traditional academic journal. It was a shorter type of article and it was a lot more applied. So I would say that sort of our outlet is more applied research journals um, because we show how we made, what, how we worked with families and um, the language, is, it's a lot, it was not very academic, I would say. So um, I think that's the type of, going forward, I think that those are the types of uh, articles that we would try to get out more often just because it speaks to more of the communities that we work with. I guess I have a follow up to that as well for you, Tarana, um, as well as anyone else who wants to chime in, but dissemination of this knowledge that you've, you know, developed as a consequence of the evaluations, what does the dissemination process maybe look like for you versus, I know, traditionally, we talk about peer reviewed journals, but what are other forms that people are engaging in maybe? So for us, um, we do we present at conferences often. Um, we'll present some of our major projects. So we, uh, we did a co-designing with families project where we that's it led us to design our parent workshops around what our community wanted to see. So we work we do a lot of work in Compton. So we did a design session with parents. So we we presented on that several times at different conferences last year. Um, I would say primarily it's the dissemination is through the reports that I build that report on the data that we've collected. And these reports go to our funders, they go to any stakeholders. Um, a lot of times we send them out to our community partners. So let's say, for example, we did a series of workshops with a nonprofit child care organization um, and they helped us recruit all these families. Then we'll send it back to that organization. And sometimes they use that report internally for their grants as well. So sometimes they show like, oh, look at the projects that we're engaging in with PBS SoCal. This is what we did. These are the impacts for our parents. So oftentimes they'll even ask us, can you just make us just a special report just about our organization, not about uh, not including everyone else you worked with so that they can just show the impact for their families. Um, so I would say that's probably like the majority of the dissemination is in those reports. And um, I sort of, I get to design how we do the reports. I don't get a lot of, um, I guess because nothing was in place. That's sort of the nice thing about this job. And I think it's very unique. And I don't know if I'm speaking to other types of industry jobs, but um, there was not, n nothing in place before. So I sort of set the standard for what things are like. Um, so it's nice to have that freedom. Thank you for that. I have just kind of like one more question maybe to close us out since we're running out of time, but what is like your one parting advice for um, doc students and you know postdocs, those who are past their PhD when trying to decide which career pathway they should take or what might be best for them? Any advice that you have um, for those thinking about which direction they should go in? Um, 
Um, I can start us off because I think uh, I did this fairly recently. So um, I think what really was important for me was keeping an open mind. I applied to a lot of different things. I applied to nonprofits. I applied to industry. I applied to lots of different things that would surprise you and, and actually got interviews for quite a bunch of different things. Um, I was this close to taking on a climate activist role, um, but then ended up choosing uh, faculty instead. But um, be open-minded, you know, and then before you really make a decision, um, prioritize what your goals are for yourself. Like, what do you wanna contribute to the world? And and figure out you know, where that lies and how you wanna accomplish that and what institutions will help you accomplish that the best. Um, I think I ended up choosing a liberal arts college because I feel such a tremendous sense of freedom. Um, at having come here, I feel a, a sense of stability uh, in terms of getting to kind of explore what I wanna explore um, while still having some stability in, in that teaching structure and, and you know, I don't know how many of you know this, but when you're faculty at a small college, you're generally an, on a nine month contract. So for, for three months, I can choose to keep working on, on research or I could choose to not work. And that goes a long way for that work-life balance piece. I mean, not that's not gonna be every year, but there are some years I might just not work for three months and I'll love that. So keep keep that in mind like what do you prioritize do you want to work constantly that's fine if that's for you you should do that um that's not for everybody and you should decide what you want um just something to add um i interviewed at a, at a lot of different places too before deciding that this was the role that i wanted and um I think when you are applying for jobs, there's a little bit of like, at least for me, like there was a lot of anxiety around applying and interviewing and you're just kind of desperate just to get a job and you're just desperate to get something and you went through all of these like, you know, five plus years of school and you just want something. But I think it's really important to take that time to figure out if you're going to be a good cultural fit there too. So do you feel like you're, you're going to have like a nice personal experience with this company with the, with the person that you're interviewing with do you feel like you'll fit in there because there were a lot of places that I went to and I was just thinking like well I could probably do this job but I don't know if I'd be super happy at this company working with this um, working here and I know like in that moment when you're just desperately wanting to find anything you that may, may not be the first thing that comes to the top of your mind like are you going to be a good fit there but um it's it's really really important I think Thank you for sharing that, both of you. I think you're um, generating a lot of support behind those statements. So um, I think a lot of people can relate to those sentiments. So I appreciate you for putting it out there. Yeah. Any other advice before we start wrapping up? Well, thank you so much to all our four panelists for again, sharing your time with us so generously on a Friday afternoon. Um, I feel like even though I've interacted with you over email and some of you have met in person at conferences, I feel like sharing your, when I heard your stories on this platform, I feel like I know you a little bit better as people, which is always very nice when you get to see the person behind the researcher. Um, so I, I really appreciated that opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for making time. Again, thank you to our audience members who submitted really thoughtful questions, which helped the ECR team uh, think through the guiding questions that guided our conversation um, for this past one hour. Uh, have a great rest, rest of your day, and I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend.